Hey, I'm gonna take you on a tour today. eye view using K Zildjian and Karops and the diehard Sabian artisan on that side is a 18 inch see the gobos these gobos I had built some time ago and they have rock soul safe and sound on the inside when I tell you that these things really 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 take care of sound they take care of sound in the entire spectrum if you're trying to really um cut down on the transmission of all frequencies these things well rock soul rather the the um product is by far the best way to go i have a big one here this is for the bass drum let me back out a bit you can see that one and when I'm doing most of my remote recordings I'll use this monitor you can see it's not on right now but and that keyboard over there is a Bluetooth keyboard which connects to my um, Pro Tools workstation which I can see on there if I'm doing drum tracks so um, that's generally how I um, record drums through this snake on the floor, a little eight channel snake, got off of eBay, Seismic Audio, which is a eight channel snake. I normally, in normal circumstances, don't go above four microphones. Um, you really, <laughs> if, you're, if you're trying to go for a big sound, then definitely you can go above four, but I don't go above four because I play mostly jazz. But if I'm doing something like a hip hop or an R&B where the toms are important, then I'll yank out some Tom mics and I'll yank out a whole nother kit. It won't be on the jazz kit, that's for sure. I have a um, Pearl kit as well and a um, 22 inch kick, 10 and 12 inch Toms that are a bit deeper and a 14 by 14 and it's a Pearl Maple Custom. Maple Session? Session Maple? I guess. I don't know, but it's, it's by Pearl. This dingy area is um, where I pretty much have store everything. If you <laughs> if you spend any degree of time in in, in um, recording, you're going to accumulate a lot of stuff. Cables being one of them, so organization of cables is important. <laughs> That's where everything interfaces into the control room from that snake to here, okay, which is, and if you look carefully, it says ADAT Optical, ha ha ha, ADAT Optical. Once upon a time, boys and girls, once upon a time. Cable, there's Tyrone Burkett back there, and Dolores is below, and some other people. And this is the, Kings of Infinite Space, my good buddy Alan Glover. I had an opportunity to record his record. Both of his records, um, sorry, both of his records. I don't know why I'm shouting, but let me move this lapel down a bit so I don't get all shouty. But Kings of Infinite Space, this was a really cool recording with um, Howard Great on drums. Had a lot of fun recording that one. And this area here, I generally will use the vocals because of its symmetry. And I'll put gobos behind the um, vocalist. I don't understand why people use those reflection 
filters when in fact the capsule is facing outward and the object is to prevent reflections from getting back into the microphone and people have the reflection filter thing is behind the mic. Retarded concept, you'd be better off just using some foam or a blanket right behind the vocalist in order to get um, decently recorded sound because that's what's going to prevent the reflections from behind the vocalist getting back to the microphone. So if you have a blanket there, there's absolutely no way reflections are going, going to get back to the mic. But that's for another episode. This is my um, big and heavy ultimate stand for my heavier mics, like my um, heavier and expensive studio solid tubes or um, any of my Normans or um, my AKGs. You know, if I have heavy stuff, then definitely it goes on there. So that's that. And my cable wall, again, organization is key. For me, I don't like chaos, disorder, and pandemonium. So, and this is the Furman um, headphone system. I got so tired, and, and on Alan's last record, it was a pain in the behind because these guys were, I had to put everybody out of the control room because the way he had his studio configured, um, it was like, you had to feed individual signals to every person's um, headset. So imagine, if you will, two saxophones, a trumpet player, a drummer, a keyboardist, a bass player, a pianist, I rather, and a bass player, all wanting different mixes. Pain in the behind. I was like, Alan, sorry, everybody out. I had to get the mixes separate. And then... Um, that's when I realized that a, a, a independent mix situation for performers is the way to go. And there are a couple out there right now. There's um, Furman. You can pick these up on eBay for a song. Um, there's a Here Technologies has one, Avium, and even Behringer. I don't know how good the Behringer stuff is because, hey, man, Behringer is like, I don't know, man. I had some bad experiences with their stuff, man, jacking up on me. So I don't use it too much anymore. And, um, but those are the way to go when you want to have a decent, um, mix going to the, to the, um, performers. And I'm going to take you around the room. You can see the room and I'll take you from the left, the left, from the left to right. I'm going to take you from left to right. Um, one thing I want to stress that I think is very, very important is that you set up your studio based on what it is that you're doing. I, you know, service clients as a producer, and oftentimes um, it requires me having to compose, produce, and finally record their material. Like sometimes, I'll give you an example. I had a client once come to me. She had rough tracks. I want to do this thing from the ground up, production from the rough track all the way up to the, you know, produced um, product. Fine. So what I had to do I had to compose it, you know, notate it rather, I should say. And then for after it's notated, I produced it. And then after it's, those produced tracks wind up in Pro Tools as the final tracks. Um, from left to right, it's um, Sibelius. Excuse me, sniffing, because it's the fall here in New York and it's a pain in the behind with my allergies. But um, I use Sibelius to record, to, to record, to score everything. And that's, you know, one of the best scoring programs I've used. I've used um, Finale as well. I have Finale, but I prefer Sibelius. i um, not saying one is better than the other, but I do prefer Sibelius, just based on the workflow. And guess what? I still use, let me move this chair out of the way. I still use Logic Express 8. You know why? It works. Simply, you got all those software instruments in there. It works. I like it. And um, hey, man, it's part of my workflow. Another thing I still use, let me move this chair out of the way again, is Pro Tools HD 8. Why? Because it works. And I've paid thousands upon thousands of dollars in investment to what's now Avage, former 
digi design and um all the clients want in the end is a <laughs> file that's 48 24 24 so if i'm able to give them that in the end then that's great i don't do 96k sessions why i know people who do but um the file size is ridiculously large and you need a super duper fast computer and with the logic 8 i am still using my g5 yes sir boy um, this is an Intel i7 Mac or for Sibelius and um, and in the corner there is my um, Xeon 12 core for Pro Tools HD and using 96 IOs with a sync IO for master clock why? Because occasionally I get film projects in and, you know, you'll need to sync something exactly to a particular point, you know, and when you're locking to film, if someone <laughs> sends you those sort of files, you, when you're locking to film, you have to be able to reference some sort of synthy reference. And that's what that does for me, especially if I've got to compose tracks that need to drop in at a certain point, what I'll do, I'll compose in um, Logic, which is MIDI synced to, okay, let me get this unhooked here. It'll be synced to the, this clock via MIDI, MIDI time code, and it'll drop the tracks, bang, exactly where they need to be dropped. Okay, I'll bounce this down to a QuickTime file and send that back to the client, who will in turn, you know, pull the audio out separately, mix it, you know, in the case of um, the All Me film, The Life and Times of Winfred Rembert, that's what happened. The, the, the um, film editor would send me um, quick times with synthy references and an EDL, an edit decision list. We'll talk about that in a future episode. But he would send me that, and at each point he, he would, you know, okay, well, I want this type of music here. I want that type of music there, or if it was Q music that they had to have a license for, don't you know screw around with anything here because we're going to put um, you know something we have to pay for at this particular empty location. So that's important to have this clock. Okay, onward to the API rack. Um, these are newly acquired, the red ones. Always wanted them, got a pair, and now I'm a happy little camper. And when I tell you they sound amazing, um, I just recorded um, some original material with Berta Moreno, who is a fantastic um, young female tenor saxophonist. Her sax and co combined, check this out, combined with an Audio Technica ATM 2050, a, a like $250 microphone. When I tell you those tracks sounded amazing, they sounded amazing. And that's due to the Focusrite Red Ones. Onward to the Five Fish Studios. Um, this is a company that's out of, uh, I think they're out of Nashville. And this guy hand builds these on preamps. He uses Carnhill transformers on the inside. Uh, you should check them out. They're on fivefishstudios.com. I think it's their website. These are the best kept secrets right now. And they have them in Sweetwater, finally. But these are the Frettenstein's artistic mic pre and these sound simply amazing on drum. They replicate API 512s in both design and sonics. And guess what? You can snatch the um, op amps out and swap the op amps if you guys are into, you know, that sort of thing. You can take the op amps out and color it through the op amps any sort of way you want to. So these are simply amazing. And here's my lonely Rupert Neve Designs 511. This is an unbelievable microphone preamp. Sounds great on just about everything. But if I had to have my choice between this Rupert Neve design and these, I'm sorry, the red ones win. It's just, they sound so sonically beautiful. I almost feel like crying right now. Oh, God. Okay, joke aside. Move on. Down to here. This these are a drummer's best friend. 
And this is also a singer-songwriter's best friend. These are the Focusrite ISA ones. I had to pull the legs up in this thing here. I'm holding like it. Agreeable with any microphone you have. Only thing you have to do is change this little switch here. Bat, 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 bat. And you got the right impedance. And the impedance matching is so important because if you improperly match the impedance, sometimes you shave off the top end. Sometimes you get a woolly sound depending on the microphone that you're using and the capsule and these components that they use in the microphone, especially if it's a cheap mic. Nah, man. You need to be able to dial in the right impedance. And these are very, very flexible. These are a drummer's best friend, honestly. And if you don't properly match your mics to your preamps, you're going to have a sonics problem, especially if you're um, dealing with clients. And you don't want to piss the client off because if you piss the client off, you won't be working, boys and girls, honestly. <laughs> These are prototypes of Mishawa Audio Designs MPA1s, more on that in the future. Um, I developed these in conjunction with a particular engineer, and um, they sound great. They're trans, well, not transformerless. There's a transformer on the input, but they have a very, very clean, clean output in terms of, um, like if you're doing singer songwriter type stuff, very, very clean. Very clean. I'll have more information on that in the future. And. Uh, this is a Yamaha MG10, which because I occasionally mix in a hybrid fashion, I'll use as a summing mixer, you know, depending on the project. It really does depend on the project, but as a summing mixer, uh, it works quite well and creatively. So moving on, this is a Valley, my vintage Valley, 400 preamp, almost like a voice processor, you know, if you put it by today's standards. But yeah, it has a preamp, EQ, compressor, gate, and a gain output stage, you know, for the entire unit. And um, when I tell you the, the, the fatness that you get out of this thing, man, is crazy. I don't use it a lot. But um, occasionally on certain types of vocalists that'll come through if they're doing demo work for a client or something like that, um, and they are screamer types, Valley is known for having, you know, great compression, you know, and um, it, it has a, a, a thickness and a girth. Um, JV880, uh, S760, still use them. My Delta Labs Effectron is another vintage piece that I have. I think I've had this since I had my Porter Studio. Don't know what that is. You can look it up. Moving right along. JV1010. Yeah, that, that's, that's slick. And my Sound Canvas. Sound Canvas, I've done a lot of records with this thing. I can't get down low enough because I don't have the um, thing. But let me see if I can go here. And I think I can. Yeah, we can't see it. But it's, this thing is, is crazy, man. The sounds out of it, I've done a ridiculous amount of records in this. And on 8-track, 8-track tape, no less. And I mean, these are CDs that, that have been released by clients, okay? But to hear, every single solitary piece of equipment gets run through here. I guess you can tell that I am a big fan of DBX compressors. And here's the 166s at the bottom. They sound simply amazing on everything. And again, these are things you could pick up on eBay for next to nothing right now. And this is the Furman um, headphone distribution system that I was telling you about, where you get four independent submixes. Excuse the, um, let me back out a bit. Four independent submixes. Monitor out. Studio 64 XTC, I used to use that a lot back in the day. Moving right along, because I'm almost out of time on this thing here. I don't know if you can see them, but these are my lexicon. These are MPX 100s, which still get put into service through the patch bay. And I get it back up here into Pro Tools. But um, that's MPX 200 up there. 
And um, yeah, lexicons was, you know, again, they're like DBX in terms of um, they're the best. They're the best. I mean, if you want to have a good hybrid sounding studio, then you pick this stuff up, route it back into Pro Tools, and it's a sound that, I mean, only you can create. You know, plugins are cool, don't get me wrong, but everybody has the same plugins, but not everybody has the same workflow when it comes to a hybrid circumstance. So you could take this, this, um, e this reverb, feed it into the Dodd <laughs> EQ, feed it into this um, compressor, and you got a sound that's unique to you. So that's always been what's important to me, and I think that's why um, I enjoy keeping this stuff around. The Alesis 3630, another good um, bus compressor to have, you know, if you know how to manually set a compressor, great to have and extremely flexible. Okay, so that's about it. Um, let me move this thing back around. And, okay, that's about it. Um, yeah, this is the place. And let me give you a overview shot. If you were the client sitting in the client chair, not like that dingy rag there though. But if you were sitting in the client chair, this is what you would be looking at. Okay. Thanks for stopping in and taking this tour with me. In the comments below, tell me what your most prized possession is in your studio. If you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button and the alert button so you can be notified when we release new videos. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for stopping in. And oh, don't forget to say hello to the family for me. And go. Thanks so much for stopping by and hanging out. Thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for taking this tour with me.